So let me start out by first of all welcoming a lot of alums back. I'm an alum. You know, I left here in 1988, but my first uh, kind of visit to Virginia Tech was on the telephone with one professor, Tom Ward, in 1982. He called me, and I can remember the conversation distinctly because he said, "Hey, we have an electron microscope now at Virginia Tech, and you can see things at the molecular level." Come to Virginia Tech. I'm like, okay, what's an electron microscope? <laughs> and the other question was, but do I have to come in the summertime? Is this a full time thing? And, and, you know, and Tom is a very kind, gentle guy. He's like, well, most of the students do stay during the summer. Uh, so it was a big, big change, but Tom made it really easy for me. I got here in 1983. I joined Jim McGrath's research group. And, uh, you know, that guy was an, had an infectious personality. I don't know if Barbie's still here somewhere. I don't know if she's still here, but you know, Jim was Jim was an amazing guy, and uh, of course we sorely miss him. Uh, but I joined his group in 120A. We call it White Oncology, OSHA Palace, and, right? That's what he called it, right? And uh, we survived. We lived long enough through those times. In 1987, I missed my poster in New Orleans at the ACS meeting in the fall of 1987 because I met my wife. Right? And she distracted me to the point where I didn't show up for my poster at a national ACS meeting. <laughs> I was riding a horse and buggy somewhere in New Orleans <laughs> around Jackson Square, and I was pretty upset. <laughs> From there, off to industry, then I was fortunate enough to come back to Virginia Tech in, in 1998, in December. I've been here almost 20 years, right? And it's been an amazing ride at Virginia Tech. I always say to people, how can you not be successful in polymers at Virginia Tech? <coughs> it's virtually impossible, right? Because we have the infrastructure, the collegiality, the interdisciplinary approach, and the wonderful students, right, that it takes, right, to be successful at Virginia Tech. So let's talk a little bit about that. So I want to say thank you to Virginia Tech since 1982. Here's a picture of our mentors. Many of the students remember this particular <coughs> picture, and we use it fondly. Right? These were great friends. Right, this was a grassroots, this wasn't a top-down effort at Virginia Tech. It was three scientists who worked together because they wanted to. Right? They were passionate about what they were doing, Wilson Ward and McGrath. Right? I always remember you know, this particular picture of McGrath. Uh, he liked to Photoshop his head on everything. Right? And here he is, multi-functionality, drinking a wine, breakdancing at the same time. I actually think he did this in my wedding. Uh, I'm pretty sure he did. Okay. So what I want to do in my 10 minutes with you is force you to rethink plastic, right? And to a certain extent, I'd like to say that's the fourth R, right? We know reuse, recycle, reduce. These are things that we think about all the time, but maybe the word we really need to be thinking about is rethink, re-innovate, change it, okay? The manufacturing protocols that we use today for plastics were discovered in 1950. Right, that was even before I was born. Maybe around the time we were all born, right? 1950, thermoforming, injection molding, blow molding, all these what we call legacy manufacturing techniques. And then the next question in your mind might be, why is a chemistry professor worried about manufacturing? We make molecules. <laughs> but at the end of the day, we want our molecules to make it to the shelf, right? To the grocery store, to the satellite, to Mars, right? Wherever, right? That's what we want to do. So how do we do that? How do we rethink the way we take a molecule and place it into a shape, a geometry, some type of complex architecture that we have to for? That's what I want you to think about. The quote, if you're old enough to remember 1967, right, from the graduate, there's a great future in plastics. Yeah. The Science History Institute, right, says everything from computers to cell phones to life-saving advanced amount of medicine made from plastics. <clears throat> Next time you're in your car, look around and count the parts made without plastics. But the other quote we hear most recently, and I'm sure everyone has, is by the year 2050, there will be more plastic than fish in the world's ocean. As scientists, do we want that to be our legacy? Absolutely not. And we don't want that. Right? I want to 3D print the next liver. Right? That's what I want to do. Because I want to make that list to get that new transplant much shorter. Right? And it takes that kind of complexity and thinking, I think, for our future scientists, like Assad and others, right? How do we take molecules and put them into a geometry that gives you some type of, you know, kind of cool performance? All right. So I was born around this time, and I suspect some of you else were born around this time, right? 
And I went to Virginia Tech about that time, in 1983, and look at the growth in plastics in the world since 2014. We currently sit at over 600 billion pounds of plastic every year across the earth. That's a lot of plastic, right? And how much of that do we recycle? Anybody want to take a guess? People are shaking their head and holding up little things. Right? We recycle roughly 10% of all the plastic manufactured today, which means that roughly 600 billion pounds of plastic are on this earth every year unchanged. That's kind of upsetting, especially as a polymer scientist. You know, I don't want to leave this world and say, okay, this is what I've left in the world. I've left in 600 billion pounds of plastic every year. I don't want to do that. Right? But that's our legacy at Virginia Tech. We have always been pioneers in polymers and plastics. How do we change that? Or how do we change that? Let me give you some other sobering information from Earth Day in 2018. There's that recycling uh, kind of average. It's around 9 or 10 percent. This is from CNN's you know, kind of Earth Day uh, kind of you know, special show they had online. And this kind of number here is often very um, sobering to me. 2.5 million plastic bottles are used in the United States every hour. Every hour. Think about this. This is an amazing statistic. And let's not forget that China and India are growing at a very fast rate. And they want the, the, the you know, kind of the nice things about plastic, too. This will not slow down. I just came back from Shanghai about a month ago. And I can tell you the investments in China are amazing for the growth of plastics in Asia Pacific. Right? So this is not going to slow down. That curve is going to continue to grow. So how do we address that? Well, we can't address it too easily because the industry and the jobs is amazing. But at the same time, what is the consequence of what we're enjoying? How do we change it as scientists? How do we rethink what a plastic is? How about a K-cup? How many people like K-cups? I love K-cups. I love them. I pop them in, I get a beautiful brew, and it's just, I take the cake cup and I throw it out. The cake cup is a multi-layered structure. It cannot be recycled very easily. Um, it is thrown away, and there's a lot of them used. Last year alone, they sold more than 9 billion traditional single-serve plastic coffee cake cups. It was reported by the New York Times in 2016. Where are they going? They're going into our earth. Are they going to be break down and turn back into oil? Not for a long time. They're not designed to do that. Right? You know the petroleum days, they're not petroleum. Right? They're not petroleum. We change them. We need to change this. The manufacturing processes today to make a K-cup lead to about 43% of waste because the process is thermal forming where they take a plastic sheet, they put it over the top of a mold, they turn the K-cups out, and they throw out whatever, all the little plastic in between. And what do we do with it? Recycle it? Reuse it? No. We put it in a warehouse, and we don't know what to do with it. If you visit a nice company in Pulaski, Virginia, right, they make K-cups every month at a frantic pace. Now, this company is changing things. They're not using polypropylene. They're injecting molding, and they can be recycled. Will we take our K-cup and put it in a recycling bin? Really? I don't know. I'm not convinced we will. Not yet. All right. So let me talk about one strategy to reduce this kind of, you know, kind of impact on the environment. Let's talk about added manufacturing or 3D printing. It's an exceptionally hot topic these days. We know it is, right? We see it all the time because we're taking very traditional manufacturing processes using molds and injection molding and blow molding and even milling. And we're putting molecules in the spaces we want to put them. We put the exact number of molecules that we need. We don't throw anything out. We're going to use them exactly. And those parts don't need to be solid. I always tell my class these days, does this table have to be solid? I don't think so. It doesn't need to be. Why is it? Well, because it's a piece of wood and we have the saw. Well, what if we could do something different? What if we put the molecules into a, a metal material that is a mechanically engineered object using air and materials and get this maybe better strength than what's currently here? Okay. 
So that's what I want to challenge you to think about. And the term I like to use is not a pixel, but we put molecules into a mosaic. It's much like Notre Dame Cathedral. If you look at the stained glass window, let's put the molecules into a printed array, a geometrically synergistic placement of molecules side by side. That's called a voxel or a three-dimensional pixel. Okay? The other statistic in the Department of Energy is that the added manufacturing will reduce energy used by 50%, less energy is needed, and we're going to reduce the amount of materials in the clock by up to 90% because things don't need to be solid. They don't need to be solid. That's something I want to totally get away from, right? We need highly matrixed engineered materials that encompass voids and air and other types of molecules. So if you haven't heard about 3D printing, I'm surprised because the internet gives us all kinds of web pages how it's going to change the world, it's going to cure cancer, it's going to 3D print a liver, it's going to cure obesity, it's going to cure everything, right? That's what we think, right? That's what I think, of course, but that's what people are you know, kind of saying to us, right? What's your perception of added manufacturing or 3D printing? What's your perception of it? Well. Mine at the beginning in 2014 was this. <laughs> right? You're going to 3D print like a little gadget. You know, something out of Star Wars, a figurine, something you can do at this corner store and give it to your grandchild or your son or your daughter or whatever, right? It's not so sophisticated. It's certainly not all that useful. It's just a little toy. Maybe if you like Big Bang Theory, and I do, right, a lot, um, is because we can 3D print figurines of Howard and Letter and Sheldon and Raj. Right? Maybe that's it. Okay, let's change that. Let's change that for you. Okay? This is our first paper in 2014 when I met with the College of Science. They said, please don't show a lot of chemistry. Because people don't want to look at that chemistry, but I love chemistry. That's what I do, right? This is the only chemical reaction I'll show you. We take molecules that are called ionic liquids. So if I have a test question, I say for five points, what's an ionic liquid? The students say it's a liquid that's ionic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got Trump five. Okay, I got you that right. right. Yeah. Well, we're going to place molecules now into three-dimensional geometries that are essentially responsive. This, in this case, can I print a part, when I place a small voltage on it, it will move, it will deform, it will morph, it will do something. And we're going to have resolutions and sizes, you know, very small, in this case, the size of a penny. This is highlighting C and news, not C and E snooze, right? Because that's going to pick it up and fall asleep when we read that funny thing, right? But C and E news, right? I highlighted this not too long ago. I remember going to TSA in an airport doing this interview. I felt like a rat, you know, like doing this kind of thing. He was a visiting professor, and sometimes I think I'm a visiting professor. <laughs> now we take the molecules and put them in virtual reality. What's that? I thought that was just a game, right? Hey, oh, no, no. At Virginia Tech, we have a virtual reality theater called The Cube. We take a, a, a structure that's maybe the size of this you know, right here, size of a penny, and I make it three stories high. And then I stick my head inside of it, and I use colorimetric mapping to see how efficient this 3D printing was. If it's red or it's yellow, I can determine, did I put the molecules in the right place? I can walk inside. If this is a liver, I can see is the torch velocity, is the transport, is the, is the, is the structure what we need it to be by virtual reality, and that's what we're doing now at Virginia Tech. Let's finish you off with one example, because I know we want to get going, we're a little bit late. But let me show you our latest paper, our latest manuscript. So the challenge is to 3D print a poly image. And if you came from McGrath's group in 1985, we were making them. Right? McGrath was leading in that space. And if you're from DuPont, and I know there's where's Teresa Randall and is she here? Did she step out already? Right, DuPont people are here. These have the highest thermal stability that we know. This is 450C. <coughs> Remember, if you cook your brownies at 450C, you're operating at about 1,000 F, right? So your brownies turn into carbon or something like that, right? But these types of materials are used in very sophisticated technologies from satellites to <coughs> aircraft to engines and cars to medicine to all kinds of applications. Now, they're only available in what's called a 2D form factor. To a chemist, that has no meaning to me. To a mechanical engineer, that's what they call it, a 2D form factor. I call it film, right? That's what I call it, right? I mean, engineers, they call it 2D form factor. I'm like, whoa, what's that? Okay, well, if we look at the Smithsonian, and you see these films that are available around the Apollo lunar module, you see these kind of yellow, you know, metalized films, and they look like they were important. And we can remember if you're old enough, even on the TV, looking at this yellow-looking thing that was on the TV. I think there was color TV back then. I don't know. I think there was. 
This is called a camera. <laughs> <laughs> if you are born after 1994, it's called a camera. <laughs> this is something we used to carry around, right? And we actually took pictures and we printed it and looked at them at our kitchen table. Now we don't do that so much. But you'll notice that these yellow films are all two-dimensional form factors. So the question becomes, can I 3D print poly image into a three-dimensional geometry and see what happens? Well, the answer is going to be yes, right? Because I'm going to show you. <laughs> Even in mobile phones, they have two-dimensional film factor form factors, right? So this is a mobile. Don't take your phone, your phone apart. <laughs> to me, that scares the jeebus out of me. Right, I don't want to do it, right? These are used in all kinds of applications even today in the modern world. Okay, this is one of our latest publications in advanced material. I can remove that, but that's already out here. So the first thing we did was 3D print a chess piece, a rook. Now, if you ever play chess, there's some complexity down the center of the rook staircase, which you can nicely see. And this is the first example of taking a two-dimensional form factor and converting it to a three-dimensional object that's stable to 1,000 degrees F or more. Right? This is a fully aromatic polymer. If you, anything you remember from chemistry, right, a benzene ring is pretty rock solid, right? Unless you do electrophilic aromatic substitution reactions. <laughs> um, but in this case, right, this is a system for just about everything, including processing, unless we 3D print it in a novel way. So now we take the molecule Capcom, which can go into space and print it into a three-dimensional object. Right? In this case, it's a rook. But what we also discovered, kind of like the movie Ant-Man, where you take this guy and you shrink this person down to smaller and smaller and smaller, but they don't lose their resolution. They stay the same. They kind of look good still, right? Take the rook, shrink it down. I call it three-dimensional drying, which is kind of weird. I'll talk about it later. But you take this small, this part, these are molecules. Let's not forget <clears throat> that. We take these molecules and we shrink them down into less than one micron resolution. Now, what kind of resolution is that? Well, the human hair is about, huh, it's about 100 microns. Unless you don't wash it a lot, maybe there's some greasy <coughs> buildup or something, right? But it's about 100 microns. We're talking about one 100, right, resolution of the printed part, which is kind of slick. And we get that from the printing of an object and then the systematic 3D shrinking down into a small size. These parts are stable to 1,000 degrees F. They're going to go on aerospace and satellite. That's our, that's our dream, right? So we have to do a lot of chemistry behind that. We also have to come up with printers. So how we print is we take a movie, we slice that video into 100 micron slices, and then we shine the video over a surface of a, poly, of a polymer until we build the object up into a three-dimensional structure. Now, how do we do this as chemists? We have to befriend a mechanical engineer. And I have a really good one called Chris Williams. He's my good friend and one of the best rising stars here at Virginia Tech in the College of Engineering. Together, we're dangerous. <laughs> we're dangerous, OK? So here, in this case, we're printing polyimides using a scanning mass projection microstereolithography system that's housed in Goodwin Hall in the College of Engineering. Here's our latest parts that we printed. They look kind of cool. Uh, actually, what we do with these parts is we convert them to carbon. Now, we were talking about coal earlier. What we do is take organic molecules, heat them up to high temperatures, and make carbon, make graphite. Right now, we can 3D print carbon. Wow, now that's interesting, because now I can 3D print fuel sources. I can 3D print electrodes. I can 3D print uh, new scavengers or membranes to capture terrible things coming out of factories. I could put carbon into a three-dimensional shape. Right, which is kind of cool. In this case, we're actually converting it to a carbon source that burns, and we're slipping it into a ceramic 3D printed sheet. Kind of cool, right? Kind of interesting. Our students are ah, some of the best students we have in the world here at Virginia Tech and Polymer. I can guarantee you that. We get tremendous good students here. Chemistry. So the last few slides, I'll just show you. Show Dr. McGrath one more slide. Right? <laughs> now we're printing the molecules with a pen. So what we do is we take the molecules, we stick them into basically a pen, a nozzle, a syringe. We shine a laser around that as we print it, and we do photochemistry around the molecules to convert them into space, into place. Okay? So now what do our structures look like? Now they look like this. So we take a poly image that's only, only been available in the 2D form factor, and we convert it into three-dimensional objects. People always ask me, why are you doing this? What are we going to use it for? And I, my answer is always, I don't know. 
right? I don't know because we've never had these before, but I'm going to figure it out, right? We're going to find something for these, right? These are going to get funding from the NSF or the DOD or something, right? That's amazing. And we're going to get lots of papers, right? Those are what make us happy, right? But these types of molecules can be printed in a variety of different shapes. And now what we're doing is we're taking those shapes and pyrolyzing them and generating high temperature polymers and carbon with incredible resolution that you really haven't seen, seen before. So that's the kind of snapshot I wanted to give you today. And I wanted to tell you that you know, what motivates us is you know, how do we make plastics move into a completely new direction? And how do we leave our legacy a good one? Right? How do we change that? And this is, I hope, one example to show you what we've been doing. So with that, let me thank the Department of Chemistry for their confidence in me to represent faculty and show some science. And we thank the College of Science and Dean Sally Morton uh, also for her confidence. And finally, uh, let me thank you for coming and share with you one of my favorite quotes from Linus Pauling. The best way to have a good idea is to have lots of them. Right. So thank you very much. Have a great visit to Virginia Tech.